Bibles this morning, you'd open them to John chapter 8, verses 38 through 47. John chapter 8, beginning at verse 38, and we're going to read through verse 47. And if we could stand this morning in honor of the reading of God's Word. <coughs> I read this morning from the King James text, John chapter 8, beginning at verse 38. I speak that which I have seen with my Father, and ye do that which ye have seen with your Father. Now, I'm going to stop real quick for a second here. Again, I'm going, this, I'm going to have to plug the oneness a little bit to help you understand the oneness of God. Notice the Lord said, I speak that which I have seen with my Father, which almost makes it sound like he was sitting down next to the daddy and, and watching something. But then he says to the same people that he's speaking with, and ye do that which ye have seen with your Father. As if they had sat down with the devil and watched something happen, which obviously they hadn't either. So really, it is not, this doesn't speak at all of uh, persons or positions in any regard, but rather the Lord is simply saying that yeah, I, I speak that which I have seen with my Father, meaning that when he was existing as the Father rather than as the Son, he says, That's the, that is where I speak from. Okay? And he said, you do that which you have seen from your father, meaning, again, that just like children that learn from the example of a parent, we as human beings have the tendency of doing that which we have seen our father do which uh, we're going to get into that in a minute to see who he's talking about. They answered and said unto him, Abraham is our father. Jesus saith unto them, If ye were Abraham's children, ye would do the works of Abraham. But now ye seek to kill me, a man that hath told you the truth, which I have heard of God. This did not Abraham. Ye do the deeds of your father, then said they to him, We be not born of fornication. We have one Father, even God. Jesus said unto them, If God were your Father, ye would love me. For I proceeded forth and came from God, neither came I of myself, but he sent me. Why do ye not understand my speech? Even because ye cannot hear my word, ye are of your father the devil, and the lusts of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning, and abode not in the truth, because there is no truth in him. When he speaketh a lie, he speaketh of his own, for he is a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, ye believe me not. Which of you convinceth me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do ye not believe me? He that is of God heareth God's words. Ye therefore hear them not, because ye are not of God. I want to just talk to a little, for a little while this morning on the topic of like father, like son. Amen. Master, we thank you, God, for your word this morning. Help us, God, by your anointing to deliver this word in a way that will bring honor and glory to your name. Help the ear of the hearer, God, to be anointed to receive the message that you've placed on my heart for this hour. God, lift us up to higher places in you, we pray. For we've come into this place with this desire and this goal. And, Master, today we don't want to leave the same way that we came, but we want to leave changed. Master, help us this hour, we pray. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated this morning. Many make the mistake of believing that all of humanity is born of the same Father, or we're all from the same family. But the truth of the matter is this. There are two families on planet Earth. One that is born of Satan, the prince and power of the air, and one which is reborn or adopted and grafted into the family of God. 
If we have not been truly, genuinely, biblically born again into the family of God, then we are still members of Satan's family. The true, undiluted, unperverted Word of God is like fresh spring water to a parched man's soul when he is a believer. But to the deceived and lost, those same words are an offense. Amen. The Word of God that Jesus spoke was an offense to them that heard Him because their Father was indeed not God. The Lord said, if your father were God, then you would not be offended by my speech. You would welcome it. You would rejoice in it. You'd be happy for it. But they didn't like what he had to say because God was not their father. I'll tell you today, there's a lot of preachers and a lot of churches and a lot of quote-unquote Christians who don't like this morning what this preacher has to say. But I have to tell you the reason for this is simple. God is not their father. They may be like these religious types who stood in front of Jesus and declared Abraham is our father. Isn't it funny that first they tried to point to their heritage in the flesh. Abraham is our father. And when the Lord shot that argument down and said, Honey, Abraham would have rejoiced to see my day. Abraham would have been glad to hear what I have to say. Then suddenly they turn around and say, Well, we're not born of fornication. We have only one father, and that is God. But they didn't point to God first. No, they pointed to Abraham first. I love talking to people who want to tell me about their great spiritual heritage. Well, I'm third generation UPC, or I'm fifth generation Assemblies of God, or I'm fourth generation Southern Baptist. Honey, I don't care what your spiritual heritage is. It does not mean that you are born of God because you're born in, into some sort of a religious background the biggest mistake people make. They think because they're born into one religious background or another that they are immediately part of the family of God. Wrong. You become a part of the family of God by being born again into that family. Not born again according to what the assemblies of God said. Not born again according to what the church of God says. Not born again according to what Billy Graham says or what Jimmy Swaggart says. Born again according to what the Word of God says. And if you haven't been born again the Bible way, then children, you're still lost. You still need to be saved. You still need to become born again because you're still part of the enemy's family. Oh, that's hard, isn't it, this morning? Lord have mercy. That's tough preaching, isn't it? But you see, the Bible tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved it is the power of God. Amen. I love to hear somebody preach a good Jesus name message. I love to hear somebody preach a good message on baptism in Jesus name or the gift of the Holy Ghost because I know it is the power of God unto salvation. Amen. It doesn't offend me. It thrills me. Glory to God. And those who would be saved, it does not offend, but rather it excites them as well to hear it. Now, I want you to know today, it is not a new dilemma that there would be those in spiritual leadership who are so proud of their heritage and yet who are so far from the mark and they're not doing what God would call them to do. It's not new that they would be doing that today. It's been this way for millennium. Look at what the Word of God says in Jeremiah 23, verses 19 through 32. Behold, a whirlwind of the Lord has gone forth in fury, even a grievous whirlwind. It shall fall grievously upon the head of the wicked. The Lord's talking about the wicked. But now listen, listen carefully, and you'll hear the wicked defined. The anger of the Lord shall not return until he have executed, until he have performed the thoughts of his heart. In the latter days he shall consider it perfectly. I have not sent these prophets. Who are the wicked the Lord's angry with? Prophets. He said, I have not sent these prophets, yet they ran. I have not spoken, 
Yet to them, yet they prophesied. The Lord said, I didn't send them, but boy, they sure did go where they were going in a hurry like I had. I didn't speak to them, but boy, they sure did act like they had something to say. Rod Perfley can get up every Sunday and preach a bunch of trash when the reality is God hadn't spoken to Rod Perfley. He may be preaching, but that don't mean he's heard from heaven. Hallelujah. And the problem is today we still have false prophets that get up and preach a bunch of garbage and trash, and it's not from God. God said, I have not sent them, and yet they ran. I have not spoken, and yet they have said, thus saith the Lord. My Lord, have mercy. Now listen to this now. But if they had stood in my counsel and had caused my people to hear my words, then they should have turned them from their evil way and from the evil of their doings. Am I a God at hand, saith the Lord, and not a God afar off? The Lord says, aren't I a God that stays close? Amen. Aren't I a God that stays handy? I'm not the kind of God that's way out in the boondock somewhere. He said, I'm right at hand. I'm not afar off. I'm close to you. Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Whew, saith the Lord. Do not I fill heaven and earth, saith the Lord? I have heard what the prophet said that prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart, which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams which they tell every man to his neighbor, as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. My Lord, have mercy. How many people today, Juan, because of what preachers have preached and preachers have said, how many people think that they're going to trade in Christianity and they start investigating other faiths and other religions because they just think that because of what that preacher said, I need to go elsewhere. I need to look elsewhere. That's exactly what the Lord is saying here in Jeremiah. He said, they're trading my name in for the name of Baal. Why? Because of what the prophets have said. My Lord, have mercy. Saying, oh, they've dreamed dreams. I'll never forget this one idiot that got up and made, wrote a book or whatever it is about she claims to have had a vision of hell. And in her vision of hell, she said that the angel showed her that this is the section reserved for homosexuals. Now, how stupid a comment is that? How idiotic a statement is that? And in saying such things, I've had a dream, or I've had a revelation, or I've had a vision. In saying these sorts of things, they drive people away from the God of mercy, and the God of grace, and the God of truth, and the God of love. And they drive these people right into the arms of false religions, and false doctrines, and false teaching. Why? Because they're saying, I've dreamed, I've dreamed, but it wasn't from God. Don't any of these people have enough sense to know that you can have a dream, you can have a revelation, you can hear a word, and it can come from a source other than God? But see, they don't know the test. If they understood what the true test was to know whether it was God speaking or not, God is not the author of fear. God doesn't use fear. That's not a technique that God is desirous of using. The Word of God tells us that God uses His love and His grace and His mercy. The Bible said it's the goodness of God that leadeth men unto repentance, not fear. God's not trying to strike fear into the hearts of people. God is trying to reveal His love in the hearts of people so that they'll turn to Him out of love and appreciation for Calvary and not fear of an eternal damnation. The Roman Catholic Church wanted to use that concept of terrifying people so that it would fill their coffers with money. And they used the concept of hell and purgatory in an effort to fill their coffers. And the Protestant churches, daughters of the whore, came along and proceeded to use the same techniques and the same tactics to try to fill their pews. God help us. 
Maybe if I preached that kind of a message, we'd have a whole lot more people in church this morning. But you know what? Hell would be just as full and heaven would be just as empty because how many people you've got in church does not determine how empty hell will be or how full heaven will be. Lord, have mercy. Then the Lord goes on to say, The prophet that hath a dream, let him tell a dream. And he that hath my word, let him speak my word faithfully. What is the chaff to the wheat, saith the Lord? Is not my word like a fire, saith the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces? Therefore, behold, I am against the prophet, saith the Lord, that steal my words, every one from his neighbor. They take away rather than give. Rather than giving God's people's word, the word of God, they take the word of God from God's people. They say, no, that doesn't apply to you. No, that doesn't have anything to do with you. No, sir, Mr. Homosexual, that doesn't, John 3.16 doesn't speak to you. I'm stealing it away from you. I'm taking it away from you. My Lord, have mercy. Behold, I'm against the prophets, saith the Lord, that use their tongues and say, He saith. Behold, I am against them that prophesy false dreams, saith the Lord, and do tell them, and cause my people to err by their lies and by their likeness. Yet I sent them not, nor commanded them, therefore shall not profit this people at all, saith the Lord." One can quickly and easily see the difference between those who have been born again and those who have not. The Lord tells us in our primary text today that those who are born of the devil are much like their father, a murderer, devoid of truth, and a liar. Amen. The children of the father of lies. So many preachers today and so many so-called Christians exist who lie and fabricate charges against people whom they do not even know in an effort to paint them evil and unclean and wicked. One, how many preachers get up in the pulpit this morning and they will speak and they will say things about groups of people that they don't even know, that they don't even know anybody who's gay. They don't even know anybody who's a drug addict. They don't even know anybody who's a drunk for God's sake. But they'll stand there and in an effort to paint them as evil and ungodly, they will fabricate one erroneous lie after another after another. I heard one preacher recently, uh, Rod Parsley, I'll name this knucklehead's name, got up on his TV show and actually had the nerve to say that lesbians were uh, dying at a much higher rate of AIDS and of all kinds of sexual diseases, sexually transmitted diseases because of their lifestyle. Now, I've got news for you. From a statistical standpoint, that's a crock of nonsense. From a statistical standpoint, you can go to any health organization you want to, and they'll tell you that what he just said is a flat-out baloney. But see, preachers think that they can get up with impunity and they can say whatever they want to say and get away with it and they'll never have to answer for it. But Mr. Parsley, I've got news for you. All liars are going to have their part in the lake of fire. It doesn't matter whether you're lying from the pulpit or lying from the pew. And too many of these people are getting up and they're painting such pictures of what... Uh, the GLBT community is like and what their quote-unquote lifestyle is like and how they live their life and they're lying through their teeth. And they think, oh, it's okay because I'm in the pool, but God will just, even if I should happen to be wrong, God will just wipe it out. And then when they come and they're exposed to uh, someone who might happen to reveal to them that their lifestyle and the way they live their life is not at all like they preach. They keep preaching what they preach anyway. Because they believe more what they say than they do what they see. Hello now. And I'm going to tell you, God is going to hold them accountable 
He said, I'm against the prophets who prophesy lies in my name. Honey, you cannot lie against entire groups and segments of our population and expect that God is just going to let you get away with it. You can't do that. You cannot do that. The Lord tells us that, uh, excuse me, so many of these uh, preachers and so-called Christians will kick young souls into the streets, giving no thought to their welfare or salvation, leaving them out in the cold to die, so to speak. You know what that makes them in my book? That makes them murderers. Amen. So not only are they liars, but they're murderers. But that's what the Lord said of those who are born of Satan, that they are liars, and the truth is not in them. You see, a lot of times, Mother, they don't want to face the truth. They don't want to deal with the truth. They don't want to reckon with the truth. I wrote an article that we have in pamphlet form called Reality Changes Things. There was a time in the history of our world and in the history of the church when it was almost impossible for an individual who is divorced and remarried to come into church and feel comfortable. I remember as a kid, if a woman was divorced, listen to this, this was a very real stereotype that I remember. She was a whore. If she was divorced, she was a whore. Oh, you better watch out for her. She'll be after your husband. You better watch out for her. She'll want to sleep with your husband. Because she's nothing but a whore. She's a divorcee. And immediately one meant the other. It's called stereotyping. But the reality was that woman might have been beat senseless by her husband who was a drunk. That woman might have divorced a man who went out and cheated on her every night of the week. And she had every biblical grounds to divorce him. And yet she was still labeled a whore because she was divorced. So you see, we're not the only ones that ever been labeled all kinds of nasty things just to make the church feel good about itself. And I remember that real well. I could name names right now of certain people in our church that a lot of people, a lot of women held tight to their husbands when old Linda Kern came nearby. Mm-hmm. Because she was a double whore because she had a kid, too, out of wedlock, know that. Ooh, she was nothing but a hussy. Yeah. And then when she finally did find a fella and they got married, oh, forget about it. She, you know, he, she trapped him and what a mess. You see what I'm saying? That's how people do. That's how people do. So I'm trying to tell you today that, like I say in my article, reality changes things that as the years went by and as the reality uh, the reality surrounding divorce became much more known in the church and in the community. All of a sudden, people began to look at divorce a lot different. All of a sudden, they began to look at divorcees a lot different. Now, a person who's divorced can come into the church, and everybody doesn't look at them like they're a slut. Everybody doesn't look at them like they're a hoe just because they are divorced anymore. You understand what I'm saying? But there was a time, Juan, when that was not the case. But reality changes things. When the more we become familiar with reality, you know what another word for reality is? Truth. But see, this is what the Lord said of these men he was speaking to in John chapter 8. See, they had no truth in them, just like their father, the devil. The devil don't want to be bothered with the reality. He don't want to be bothered with the truth. He just wants to go along and walk along in his own delusions. And that's what many in the church are doing, just like their father, the devil, like father, like son. They're walking along in their own delusions. They're walking along in their own false concepts and their own false thoughts. My Lord, have mercy. In Galatians 5, 16 through 23, the Apostle Paul admonishes us, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now listen, every time you read that, people want to point the lust of the flesh. They assume that means carnal lust, you know, physical lust. 
Honey, the lust of your flesh includes everything from the desire to want to chew somebody and spit them out, because that's not a godly way to do things. But your flesh enjoys and appreciates sometimes just chewing somebody up and spitting them out. Sometimes we like to beat somebody to a pulp and leave them there to die. That's what the flesh would like to do. But God's Spirit would have us to do otherwise. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. So you see, the lusts of the flesh that Paul's talking about here, it's not about sexual lust. He says that ye cannot do the things ye would. In other words, you're, it's, it is causing you to do the things you shouldn't do so that you can't do the things you should do. You should be loving people. But instead, your flesh is making you want to be angry with people and nasty with people. You hear what I'm saying? You should be building people up and encouraging them, but your flesh is, is desiring to tear them down and destroy them. He goes on to say, But if ye be led by the, of the Spirit, ye are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these? Adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, em uh, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envyings, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and the such like. Of the which I tell you before, as I have told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. But you know what? A lot of those things that I read in that list I see in many of your average churches in America today. Amen. A lot of the things. Hatred. I see it. I see preachers getting in pulpits full of hateful, nasty messages. Seditions. Heresies. Lord knows that 90% of the churches out there are preaching heresy and they think they're telling the truth. Envyings, murders, my word, have mercy, revelings. You know what reveling is? That's when you really party it up big time. How many Christians you know today got so much money and they're doing so well for themselves that they're just, part they may not drink a drop of alcohol, but boy, they know how to party. They sure know how to live it up big, don't they, Juan? They sure know how to spend their money. And all the while, there's a neighbor in the church sitting next to them on the same pew that's hungry, that needs a place to live, that needs a car to get to work, and they don't even stick out a finger to try to help that one because they don't even know what Christianity is about. Because in the church of Jesus Christ, if one has and another doesn't, then the way we're supposed to handle things is make sure the other one gets their need met. Amen. The blood of Christ is thicker than water. Amen. And we take care of our own. And we make sure that needs are met. And if, if I have anything to say about it, as many years as I've been in ministry, no member of my church will ever go hungry. And if I have anything to say about it, no member of my church will ever go on welfare. I hate welfare with a passion. I hate food stamps with a passion. I think all those systems are designed to make you feel bad about yourself. I think they're designed to make you feel miserable about yourself, to keep you in a state of depression, to keep you in a state of low self-esteem. And if I had my way about it, not not one of God's people that's a member of my church will ever be on any of those programs. We'll take care of our own. Thank you very much. Glory to God. The joy of heaven, people, tonight, today. For the saints of God is the absence of evil. That's going to be the joy of heaven, one. There'll be no evil there. No more shall the liar be permitted to hold a microphone and broadcast his venom from one end of the earth to another. No more will that be allowed. No more shall careless, heartless, murderous types occupy positions of power and authority where they are able to execute insincere souls, uh, excuse me, sincere souls with calloused carelessness. Heaven's going to be a happy place. Why? It's going to be a happy place because all lies and untruths shall be forgotten there. Hallelujah. 
If I love what John wrote in Revelation 21, verses 5 through 8, And he that sat upon the throne said, He that sat upon the throne, singular, not plural, singular, He that sat upon the throne said, I, singular, will make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. And he said unto me, It is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give unto him that is a thirst of the fountain of the water of life freely. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Hallelujah. Glory to God. There's one that sits on that throne, one, and he says, I'm going to be his God, and he's going to be my son. And I've got news. If you look at your Bible, you'll see that these words are written in red. Hallelujah. Because it's Jesus who's doing the talking. He said, I will be their God, and they shall be my son. Glory to God. But now listen. He said, but the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable, and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and idolaters, and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Children, I want you to know today, if you've been born again, then you'll, then like father, like son, you're going to resemble your father. And if you haven't been born again like father, like son, you'll still resemble your father. Amen. And if you want to know who's, who belongs to who, all you've got to do is look at their conduct and look at their behavior. If you see hatefulness, if you see murderous mentality, oh, I could leave somebody out in the street to die and couldn't even care about them because they're this or because they're that. There was a time in our history when a black man was looked at that way. People could look at him and see him starving, and nobody would help him because in their mind he was nothing more than a dog, and they felt, well, there's no need for me to help him. He can, if he can't find for himself, let him die. He's not worth anything to society anyway. That's murder. When you have the ability to help sustain life and you choose not to, that's murder. You don't have to drag the man by his heels behind your car down the street to kill him. If you have the ability to help him and you say, no, I don't value that person's life, and you choose not to help them because you don't value their life, that's murder. And just because you can look at the gay, lesbian community and think, well, I do not value their lives. I don't like their lifestyle. I don't like who they are. I'm not going to do anything for them because I don't feel an obligation to do so. Honey, that's murder. We know the divine principle exists today of heart reading. God looks upon the heart. God reads the heart. Man sees the actions, whereas God sees the motivations. We may do something and feel that our actions will never be called into account, but God will judge us based upon His vision and not ours. We're not going to stand before God in the judgment and be judged for our actions. We're going to stand before God in the judgment and be judged upon our heart. That's why I fear for these characters like Parsley and some of these preachers on television. Out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. And they spew nothing but hatred and all kinds of negativity and horrible things. And it makes me think, Lord, baby, when you stand before God and the, and the hearts are opened, are you going to be in a dangerous place? God knows today when we have spoken a lie, knowing full and well that we knew better in our hearts. See, a lot of these preachers are preaching stuff, and they know in their hearts that what they're saying ain't right. Because they have a neighbor who is somebody that has helped them to see that not everybody lives the way they're talking. But you, even though they know it in their heart, but you know what? God knows that you're preaching one thing when in your heart you know something else. And you will stand before God in the judgment, and you will answer as a liar. We shouldn't have to do, or we don't have to do, I should say, 
a DNA test to see whose child we are. Our Father should be obvious by the fruit that manifests itself in our daily lives. One cannot help but manifest the many traits of their father. After all, as the old saying goes, like father, like son. Amen. Would you stand with me this morning? Amen. <clears throat> Master, we thank you, God, for this message. We thank you, Lord, for this word of encouragement that encourages us to strive to be more like you, God. And Lord, that encourages us to distance ourselves from the father of lies, helps us to realize, Lord, if we're going to be true and we're going to be honest, then God, at all times, we must be honest about all things. Whether we agree or disagree, we still must be honest. Whether it's a friend or whether it's an enemy, we still must be honest. Master, in the name of Jesus, today we pray that you'd help this word to find its way into each and every crevice of our heart. Encourage us this hour, God, today to be more and more like you, that we might be like the Father. And when people look our way, they'll say, like Father, like Son. Master, today go with us, we pray. Bless our fellowship, our time together. Let every word that's said and done be to the glory of our King. For we ask it in Jesus' precious name. Amen. God bless you and amen. <clears throat>